Yeah, welcome everyone for cloud computing and big data uh, to our practical lecture 11.1 .1 that builds on our more theoretical and conceptual lecture 11 that was given by Shadi Barakat. Um, we will basically therefore using some of these data mining algorithm that he presented and I will also introduce with you a bit more on so called recommender techniques that you can probably in daily life observe when you, for instance, do Netflix or Amazon movies and so on in Amazon Prime, you usually have always this kind of suggestion. So other users maybe look this, or this is trendy right now, and we will pick their one technique out of very many. It's a big field in order to get an example of those. And all the content of this lecture here is directly, again, relevant for your assignment three. And therefore it would be good to really you know, get your attention. Before we dive into the material of lecture 3.1 and do some practical demonstrations in different clouds, uh, just basically let us review what we had the last time, where essentially Shadi had very interesting insights in how to do big data analytics and cloud data mining. And there are different fields in it. He picked two where he is directly, let's say, involved in, in a research project, as he told you, which was one very big topic called association rule mining. And this is interesting in more ways than one. So firstly, it's not personalized. So association rule mining is, let's say, looking at the shopping baskets, so to speak, as we will see it or call it usually. And he showed you the very famous example of diapers and beer. And I have to say, this is a common example derived from the UK standard. Um, this was created in the community based on UK, uh, largely because UK people always go to pubs in the evening. And therefore, they don't do this be at home business. And of course, the only reason why you do this is um, probably you have a kid at home and can't go to the pub. And that's why diapers and beer had originally there in this particular, let's say, country, a very high correlation. Of course, this also shows you that um, here and there, um, you have to be very careful when you make these, um, let's say, rules as um, basically then. Uh, the is the outcome essentially what you have out of these algorithms it doesn't matter if it's a priori or if you use fp growth you have this kind of certain group rules where you say okay bread milk and diapers will be always you know bought together but that doesn't mean that it actually is always valid for all countries in all the different data sets so it's a very specific data set assumption and of course this is being built because we look at the frequent item sets of this particular let's say shop or this particular shopping basket that we got. Usually call this transaction. So you have transaction IDs, it could be in comma separated values. And um, you see immediately here, the point I wanted to make specifically also linking to the content of this lecture today here, 11.1, where we look a little bit more into how we can give personalized recommendations. Here, this has nothing to do with personalization. Here we can just generally say, um, people that, you know, bought basically bread had a very high count also of here having milk. And then the, um, let's say the other element where we said um, we had several different options of basically Shadi was showing you have lots of different configuration items um, that you can actually fine tune this association rule mining. One idea was the support value that you can steer. That means how frequent item sets really appeared. You have usually something like we call confidence, which means essentially how often this particular rule was really found to be true. Um, it's not always, of course, 100%, as you know, from machine learning and data mining. So it gives you an indicator if we should really be confident about this rule. And then there are several others. Lift is a very interesting one. It considers the whole support of this rule compared to the overall data sets. Um, when you think a bit about more statistical elements for instance that you know lift values over one would be usually that two occurrence are dependent on each other while minus one would rather say it's actually not dependent on each other it's rather substitute of each other and so with this you probably don't want to have this in future recommended while lift values above one usually you can do in future and recommend but this is can go on and go on um, basically there's conviction there's leverage if you go to the literature you find more information uh, one interesting part that, of course, also Shadi put a light on was a cloud dependency. So the computational aspects, you see that here very nicely, usually a priori has a very big problem in scaling. 
Um, he had essentially different reasons for this. One of the key reasons was this one hot encoding that we also will reveal in practice a little bit today, which is inherent, um, let's say a little bit a problem when you compare it, for instance, to smart infrastructures or um, elements which really can take advanced data structures um, together with cloud computing using now basically this more scalable frequent, uh, uh, you know, basically frequent pattern growth algorithm where you then essentially have a tree structure and you just have links. And usually, as you know, from general computer science, perhaps tree tr structures in general are much more performant. And with this, um, you see here also, when you think about the number of transactions, which is still a playing value here of a couple of thousands. If you go to practice, you have seen from Shadi, it goes in rather millions. Um, and here you see it directly, if you take this, let's say SkyKit learn approach of a priori or something, um, then you really will not scale and FP growth would be something that relatively scales even in SkyCat Learn. And the power of computing is now, um, as he showed you, you can combine this with Spark. You have an FP growth, for instance, implementation in Spark, and this is, can then nicely scale up so that you don't have this memory problems or the memory bound of your SkyKit Learn that you normally have on the laptop. And that is basically, um, of course, a very take, very good takeaway message in that. Today, we basically put this a little bit into context of personalization, so personalized recommendations, and I will make a case for it. But also an interesting aspect that uh, basically Shadi was showing was more to the field of deep learning. So a very interesting, let's say, um, real scenario um, with, that we actually obtained by working together with beauty, um, you know, with a beauty shop owner of 150 stores in Germany which is a Pipa parfumery. And there you basically have really problems um, which actually can tackle by deep learning under the hood, but nobody will ever know that this is actually done by deep learning. And one of the uh, examples he showed to you was essentially that often customers come into stores and they want to have the perfume that looks like a lady shoe or that looks like a hand grenade we have seen or that looks like a gold bar. But nobody from these customers usually can directly know the name, right? Which is here Paco Rabanne, for instance. If you're very well into perfume, you may know that. But many people just come in the shop. I want a good Christmas idea for a gift, perhaps very early buying now. So just give me this gold bar. And of course, this is some obvious parts. There are others that are not so obvious. So when you think about a diamond or a table lamp that sometimes people say, and the interesting we found, thing we found when you look in the product description, it's really never really appearing. So with a full text search, you not really can find this product very easily. And, and this was surprising for us and also for the data that we got. In this sense, what we did there to, to actually create this and then Shadi basically was to have a kind of, you know, deep learning network trains with shapes and augmented, as he described last time, also with colors, where he used another script in order to enrich the database. So again, it's actually not a really user-facing problem. It's something where we enrich the database of this PIPA store in order to be also able now to search quickly for gold bar, for hand grenade, for lady shoe, for, for all these things. And we used the pre-trained image net, um, basically network for it and tuned that significantly. You see here some examples, what then was really happening. I mean, the teddy bear, you can see um, here the predictions from a typical image net uh, pruned by the fact that this is of course always identified as perfume. Okay, thank you very much, we know that. But when you think about um, this image, for example, we have a beaker, we have a red wine, we have a vase. These are all things where people may look on this differently, right? I like, like very much red wine. For me, this looks like a red wine decantier, right? A definitely red wine. For others, which are maybe more into flowers, it would be more like a vase uh, and, and so on. For drinks, sometimes a pitcher. So basically what you have here is a very, let's say, neutral way of giving tags for this particular picture. And this is a common, let's say, use case where for which deep learning is used today. And of course, then by having this now in the database, the search strings are there, then the basically clerks here in the store, when they get this strange question, I want to have something that looks actually like a diamond or like a cocktail shaker, really. Um, how, what is that named? And you have to think about that these shop clerks sometimes have 30,000 products in the store, 
right? So you imagine that, of course, a teddy bear may be something they know. It's somewhere in the left corner there and called this and this or the million gold bar from Paco Rabanne is well known. But maybe nobody knows really what is a cocktail shaker's name. So in this sense, and you see it's actually cocktail shaker and, and a couple of those which really make sense here again, predicted by the image net that we put in the database. And this is a very interesting way. It shows you really how deep learning can be applied. Um, and then, of course, also speed up. Um, you know, we use there, of course, cloud computing for it to make it very quick to uh, go through all the images um, that we got from all the perfumes. It's just one good example of how to do big data analytics in the, in the end by just looking of what products you have and enrich a database. So um, without, you know, basically going maybe too much details um, and again to the content of lect lecture 11, you see here we are more into the practical topics again with Shadi's lecture. We will have a very practical lecture actually in lecture 12 coming up as well. And I'll just provide you here some elements which are directly relevant for your assignment three. And then we will basically conclude the lecture series with a couple of more rather theoretical and conceptual topics, because there you could fill, let's say, very many different lecture series alone on streaming these days. Graph database is a big topic to come. So today we will go a little bit into data mining techniques first and see how what we can, you know, basically do about what Shadi was presenting more in theory and conceptual manners. Um, how we can actually use this in the cloud. And we use the ML extent library, for instance, in a so-called Helmholtz Data Federation Cloud, what you actually also should do basically in your assignment, but also learn a little bit along the way, what happens if this library is not existing? What about this? And there's this PIP package install I want to bring to your notice. You know that a little bit from earlier lectures, but this is really very important in cloud computing because rarely this virtualized images you found have maybe all the different packages you need. And therefore, it's important to know also how to operate and work with this PIP package installer. We do that two examples of an update of a previous install and so on, come to that. Then of course, we pick up the examples of a priori and FP grows. This will be done in a relatively, let's say a quick manner. I just show you that, how that works so that you have it easy in your assignment all the different aspects of how a priori and uh, FP grows on the data structure of a basically tree works have been already shed light to in lecture 11. So we don't go much into this and rather going to embark on a journey of a very rich field called recommender systems. So I start to make the difference between data mining and perhaps recommender systems a little bit and which also then includes the difference between perhaps here and there um, unpersonalized recommendations that you have seen in a priori and FP growth versus personalized recommender systems. And this is an important part where we can have lots of, let's say, hidden assets in the data um, reflected to give very good recommendations because you can imagine when it's unpersonalized, it's perhaps here and there too general. So, and this will be all basically then also the second part of this. Uh, today, we use so-called recommender systems uh, a big field and we pick here of course one example of a very known example called movie rentals yeah it's a very nice google collab script uh, which in my view is also very descriptive so it shows you really how it's done it shows you examples and actually shadi has used this script and tuned it for his needs in peeper so it should all you give you a, a chance of saying never start normally from the scratch and and just implement the whole python script on your own Rather take existing ones, uh, take a neural network script and change it to a convolutional neural network, take this movie rental recommendation and take it to your own recommendation script. So always start from something which is already there. It's in my experience often much more easier than just completely, you know, start from scratch if you want to have, achieve something very similar. And here you will see that the movie rental can be standing for, of course, ratings of movie which could be the same thing for other ratings that you have um, basically in other elements, um, no matter where you go and can basically create your own um, ratings based approach, maybe for a game hot, hot score list um, in an online manner. So whatever it is, chances are that you can reuse a lot of these. And one key aspect of this is the so-called um, embeddings and these kind of handcrafted versus automatically learned embeddings. 
Um, this will be an important, powerful context um, of this collaborative filtering recommenders, which is a, let's say, specific nature of those, and I will make the case for it. Um, here, of course, the literature and the community is a bit in two directions. So you would say the traditional data miner would says would say that is not any more um, data mining, um, perhaps because there's an optimization algorithm behind it. So essentially, we could use, for instance, in uh, in collaborative filtering SGD. And once you do this, you remember we learn something. So the machine learners would be very hard and say, okay, yeah, indeed, here's learning. But it's 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 really a very 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 simple model, maybe too simple for machine learning, right? We we going here from a ResNet 50 suddenly to something which is a matrix factorization. So that's let's say too simple learning, maybe. However, still powerful. Just wanted to say again the case that I had in earlier lectures. There's a strong overlap between data mining techniques and machine learning techniques. So the community would be not completely clear here. Is recommender systems already the realm of machine learning or is it rather data mining? One point in this is, of course, that you mine essentially the data of these different users, of these different movies, which are inherent, which are then this learned embedding, so to speak. However, you have also seen that, of course, machine learning these days is really on, on steroids with deep learning. So have very, very powerful models with lots of lots of parameters. However, machine learning also teaches us we should obey to outcomes razor, also something, a concept that was shown by Shadi, which says essentially simplest model better. So instead of making maybe a perfect, huge deep learning model for recommendations, chances are that with this simple matrix factorization approach today, which is essentially just dot product of two uh, vectors or two matrices really, um, you can actually do a lot. And of course, you also have to think about the computational price. Here in the clouds, we always think, okay, it doesn't matter. But we have also seen for a startup where maybe a recommendation engine is very essential, it could make a big difference if it's a big, deep learning network where lots of GPUs are required. Or here for matrix um, factorization, we can go with reasonable computing in the cloud. Orthogonal to what I want to show you is a very important process called CRISP, uh, which is a cross-reference industry standard process for data mining. I use it here and there for my uh, master students and also partly for PhD students to structure essentially their way, how they perform machine learning, how they perform data mining. So essentially, this is a very well-known process in the community and is often very good for reports. Um, and basically something where you can see and structure a little bit how you can go forward and backwards within the process of analyzing data. And let's say be a bit clean on that. One of my students does a COVID-19 chest X-ray master thesis, and he really jumps between all these different stages, as you will see later. And I will make the case for it why it's very nice and very clean then when you report about this. And if you go out in the field with your bosses in the industry, some may would say it's a really elaborative reporting, but um, it, it also shows really if you apply it, it has some offs. It is actually structuring your, let's say, wild, chaotic uh, machine learning and deep learning process quite good. Okay, so we have a powerful lecture today. Um, also, the third course hours, remember, don't go away after the, this, the first initial two. We have there another one. We start a little bit with, you know, some demonstrations. And here, the first one I wanted to basically give you as an example is our Helmholtz uh, cloud that we have in Germany. Again, you remember um, Jupiter is our friend in almost all AI use cases and machine learning use cases. So we expect something to be there as well. And uh, that's also what you start with your assignment. You would go to something we call this Jupiter JSC. JSC stands for Uli Supercomputing Center here where essentially I will demonstrate you now a little bit how we um, would access it. So just uh, quickly out of this, log out. So essentially you can find it already if you just do a typical uh, Google search and can go to Jupyter JSC. However, of course, you all don't have an account, so you have to register first before you log in. Um, and you see, basically, this enables us here access to all the different systems we have essentially here in our supercomputing center, Juvels, Europe number one supercomputing right now. We 
We have Jurica, another supercomputer, some visualization service, the deep cluster, and um, then also, let's say, the Helmholtz Data Federation for machine learning or for cloud computing. So, but for you, basically, it's essentially to register first. When you register, you come to something called UDOR, where you have to essentially send in your email if you want to register. In my case, of course, I have here already a registration, so I don't do this again. But if you want to register, you basically have to send an email address and then basically to your how email address, you get an invitation. And then you come to something which is called uh, UDOR. Once you basically Having access to UDOR, it will look a little bit like this, what I show you now when I'm here registered. You will see no projects in your case and no systems yet, but you see some profile information here. And essentially the point is also um, that you have to apply here for this particular project. All is in the slides as well and in the description, of course, of your assignment. So you have to apply to the project Joymel if you join a project and after the other sites, that's me and I can give you access essentially to this cloud computing system. So in the end, um, a registration process that is not really long. And once you have done all of that, you can log in. And of course, when you log in, you now have to, to basically usually pick something. So when you say you want to add a new Jupyter lab, that's also something what we explored in earlier lectures. It's a bigger lab environment supporting the Jupyter notebook environment. And here you have to basically pick one of those. In your case, it would be the HDF cloud and say start, right? So then essentially um, it will be connected. It will be creating an environment for you. Um, we will learn about containerization the next lecture, but there will be now a container provided for you on board on the HDF cloud, um, which is basically preparing now your execution. Um, takes often a while, so let's go a little bit shortly to the slides so that you see everything what I do and demonstrate is usually also on the slides. And of course, uh, lots of, um, let's say, um, different machine learning tutorials available if you want to play around with it. What I encourage you, it's an environment here for teaching. So if you want to play around with this a little bit, you have here also an example of one of the trainings I gave with one of my, let's say, uh, deputy of the research group here where we, you can basically go to these URIs um, and find lots of material, you have lots of Jupyter notebooks to try out and work in these with machine learning, with support vector machines, with, with different elements, just a hint. So if you start and actually um, have succeeded in the login, which is um, basically now here, it starts up my last script, you see something like this. Um, where essentially you would have, um, let's say, many different launchers in this Jupyter Notebook uh, available. You have different kernels provided that you can use here. And you have also the terminal where you can do a typical SSH, right? So that is quite interesting. Now we're basically here on an SSH level in the cloud remotely. Remotely, you see that always on the URI here. So this is, of course, something where um, you see directly that you're not anymore on your local laptop and somewhere else in the cloud. And basically on some node, somewhere in the cloud, you don't know. So, and by doing so, you basically um, have lots of options. Um, we come to that in a moment when I go maybe a bit further in the slides. Again, here, the idea is to register first and you do for you guys to really get access, you have to join the project Joymel, maybe just say student in class, and then you basically get a notification that you can log in. Uh, the login is then basically just picking the HDF cloud. Uh, this is important. And this is a whole system based on OpenStack um, created essentially from us for basically Helmholtz researchers and our students. And that is also something that we will pick up in lecture 13, where I remind you that I said once, here and there, we also have to think about, um, you know, what happens if you want to create your own cloud and OpenStack makes it possible. Now, what also is an important part here is these elements. So you will see that ML extend when you will now want to use a script um, and these scripts are provided to you in part of the assignment and actually part of them um, are already, let's say, um, introduced here by Shadi. Let me say restart a kernel here as an example. We have association rule mining a priori. 
make sure you have this PyDeep learning kernel here. That's important. You can switch between different ones. The PyDeep learning has all the packages usually you need except the ML extent. So if you do this, and you will basically found then that the ML extent package is not there if you basically not have installed it before. So in this sense, you have to go to the terminal. Obvious, I did this already, but pip install um, ML extent is then something what you have to execute. And this is also documented on the slide. It will get the packages from the web, install automatically then hopefully this MX, ML extent library. And uh, another way is also for some of the um, elements in the assignments where you can use also pip instead for upgrade some specific package, which is here, the SkyPy package. So just that you see a little bit how that works. Um, here you see it's all satisfied. So it's already satisfied in the end. We have already, let's say, the latest, greatest information and system. And the same you would go then with basically pip install and this upgrade that I um, already basically said to you um, and, and perform this. Otherwise, you will see directly here a problem um, when you see essentially importing because this ML extent uh, package will be not found. But I think this is very similar. You can imagine when you have TensorFlow dependencies, all of that would be very similar. Now, if you have this and it works, um, and we basically can, can do here and wait a little bit and look a bit on the slides. Now we want to look a little bit what Shadi was explaining with the a priori algorithm and what you have to do in the assignment. There's a play around a little bit with this one and the script will be provided to you. So all you have to do is to register and to execute this. That's why I said it's a little bit a trivial assignment, but uh, at least you can play around a little bit with these numbers. And of course, you see that the data set is very easy. So if you want, you can extend that and play around with it or extend it to a really production scenario later. You have these different elements where I said support is how frequent actually the item set appeared. Then the confidence is something where we say how often was a rule actually really found to be true. So here we want to have this very high value, like perhaps X and cheese that we want to report instead of another one that is not so confident. And then there's lift and leverage where I said over one and minus one and, and so on. But um, essentially we want to execute this here now and you should do this also. You see here we successfully installed the SkyPy package. Here often I would recommend to just restart the kernel and clear all outputs before you actually executing um, when you have installed something on the SSH level. And essentially there um, we can now go through the different um, cells that you know from previous assignments. Here's no surprise. There's a retail data set here that you see is very easy in terms of a shopping basket. Uh, not a number means there's no further product. So essentially you just have here five products. This will be also provided to you in the assignment. So you can just basically reuse it. We have here some unique ideas of, to see how many products we really have. One key element that, however, also Shadi was saying, we have to do this one hot encoding of the shopping basket. So this is essentially a big matrix saying which of these transactions had what, and always in basically a one means occurrence and a zero means no occurrence. And then you have this a priori algorithm uh, with different thresholds. If you know, you can do minimum support from 20, uh, 0 0.2 and, and so on. And of course, playing around with this would be a bit part of the assignment. So I don't do this here much more, just wanted to show you how that works. And now you can play around with this different, let's say, minimum thresholds. And the same is actually true uh, very much for the FP Cross algorithm. There we can also use an ML extent implementation um, and the source code will be also provided to you. So I have that here already uploaded for example. Also here, make sure you have the PyDeep learning uh, kernel existing. So before you start, maybe it's also good to do restart kernel and clear all the in, um, output. You see, I was testing this already. Also make sure that the kernel is idle and not just starting or something that is important. And then we have here a very, uh, let's say, interesting data set that you can quickly um, change yourself. I mean, this is just simple Python. If you want, you can change this and, and play around with this Extend it, of course. And here you have the same algorithm type. So we still association room miners here. But of course, there's a different algorithm, which is this tree-based FP growth algorithm that was shown by Shadi.
So you see essentially not all rocket science and uh, I don't want to do much more time on that because essentially this will be part of your assignment three. Now, when we look further now, what, what is still another interesting element, and I showed you also the you know overlaps now of data mining and machine learning and discussed a little bit already, when we come to recommender engines, it's not at all clear. This would be really rather data mining techniques. But when we talk about recommendation engines, and we're probably already in this heavy overlap scenario. So let's go to other ideas how we can do data mining. One very clear one is clustering often. Here's an example is k-means clustering, uh, which basically I also don't go much in, in, into details. You pick basically a, a center here and then you minimize the Euclidean distance and bear this. You essentially, you see that the, the center always moves and then basically all of those which are, let's say, have the minimum distance to this center will be assigned to a cluster. It's a very common algorithm, um, has some problems. It needs to be convex problems. So DB scan is usually much better that we do really in research. And here I want to now come to a very rich field called recommendation engines, where you can imagine you have different customers, you have different movies, and they can rate movies. So you come to something which are transactions, which are not anymore an, uh, let's say, a uh, kind of transaction shopping basket, but rather a personalized version of how people rate movies and this personalized is loaded and we will use essentially for for our advantage here because here we can see it has maybe one user a similar personality than the other user and this is what we want to discuss let's say in the remainder of the lecture just to basically come now to two distinctions of that you have usually a content base which is purely product based recommendations so let's say someone, uh, a user of Amazon Prime has watched some space movies, cowboy science fiction movies, cowboy movies. And basically this is a product feature. So you look in the database and see every which, you know, movie which has some tag in terms of sci-fi would be recommended, right? So this is a very trivial product base. Of course, also here and there, powerful example, because it, of course, if the people have looked many of these movies automatically is in a way clear that they like this. However, it's not so strong as really the so-called collaborative filtering approaches, um, which are much more personalized, again, so customer-based recommendation systems. Here we think about similar personalities. So you don't recommend products that are, let's say, also looked by this or that user, but you look, you recommend products which are actually looked by similar users. And this will be an important factor in this. And of course, with this, you can imagine if personalities are similar, chances are that also essentially they like the same movies. Not always the case, but there's some chances on that. So the methodology is you really um, think about, um, again, these, these different techniques of memory and model-based collaborative filtering techniques. We pick here, of course, just one for your assignment because this would be essentially today, in these days, a complete course. And we want to look, of course, in traditional, let's say, transactions. And what can we learn about the, let's say, personalities of these users? Like here is illustrated very easily. We have here two sport guys. And of course, here they buy pizza and actually salad. And because one of them is also buying Coke or something, then we probably want to recommend this to another user, which is very similar, also sporty and do, you know, pizza and salad. Just as a very high level approach, of course. And this is directly relevant for shops in all sorts of directions, online, in the store, um, everywhere, essentially. So a very powerful method. And essentially, we distinguish there between two methods, a more memory-based approach and model-based approach. Of course, both are in a way powerful. But in terms of computing, we have here and there some limits. Um, the memory-based ones find basically all the similar users that we have on some form of a similarity measure. Uh, some Pearson correlations, cuisine similarities, and so on, and then take some averages of the ratings. Um, it can be very computationally expensive, um, but usually the benefit of this memory-based approaches is that you can actually point to different users still and say why this was happening, right? So why essentially this user is very similar to the other. The problem in this model-based ones is um, you you lose this a little bit, right? So um, they reduce the dimensionality of the features, of basically of the customers of so-called learned embeddings, but these are very abstract numbers. 
So there you cannot really explain it to the store manager anymore and say, well, basically these are two similar ones because uh, the embedded features were 0 0.1 and 0 0.88 in this case. It doesn't help essentially. And this is of course a disadvantage uh, because of this Latin factors in it, but still very powerful models. Now, I think summarizing this a bit, um, you see here how that works going through this with a typical table of what people like, what not. Here also there's some implicit and explicit feedback just by looking a movie means in a way, okay, you already liked it compared to those that you didn't look because you picked it in the first place, more implicit feedback. And you see here explicit feedback where people really, you know, give uh, either yes or no, plus one or minus one and say this was good. And then, of course, we want to actually predict or recommend that to users specifically where they don't look anything. And of course, this is a hole somewhere in these big metrics that we want to basically then point to. So you have different packages for this and in your assignment, you use basically only one Google call-up. You have here another example of two libraries, a surprise package if you're really into this and work maybe downtown Reykjavik for some company that would be interested in this. Actually, these days you can use fast AI mechanisms for it. Also neuronal networks, but not so deep ones necessarily that we have seen in, in image recognition. But these packages are very valid uh, to do a specific implementation. And what we just do in the second part of the lecture is we go through this particular process called CRISP again and again, step by step, where you see you have a problem understanding first, then you need to understand a little bit the data, prepare the data for a specific classifier, for a specific recommender to perform association room mining, maybe modify the data, other features, feature selection before you finish the model for evaluation. And maybe you're not satisfied and go back to the problem understanding or you deploy it and basically automate the process that you can use this recommender now in practice every time when you have users with say as a cashier in a store. So you see it's a kind of process from beginning to the end for, uh, for uh, data mining problems and machine learning problems, same, it's just called data mining essentially. And this was already the first part of the lecture here. Um, admittably, uh, let's say quick walkthrough because you will probably gain more really if you go to the practicals, make your own steps, modify these practicals in order to learn more. So I think this is all for part one and we break here for 10 minutes and then come back for the second part.